to El Monitor's Reading the Middle East, where each month we take a deep dive with the authors and thought leaders who are shaping how we think about this complex and dynamic region. I'm your host, Gilles Kepel, professor at Sciences Po and Paris Sciences et Lettres in Paris, and author of a number of books on the Middle East. This month, my guest is Martin Indyk, Distinguished Fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations and a former U.S. Ambassador in Israel, former Assistant Secretary of State for Middle East Affairs and Special Assistant to President Clinton on the Middle East. We shall be discussing Martin's new book, Master of the Game, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy. Martin's book is based on hours of conversations with Kissinger and a deep dive into archival records. It is a fascinating read, I have to say, into a watershed period in the history of the Middle East and also of the world at large. It's a page turner, extremely well written, which I enjoyed tremendously. And it's not only a book for people interested in history. It provides many lessons for today and tomorrow with the benefit of hindsight. All the more so as the author followed in the footsteps of Kissinger when he himself conducted Middle East peacemaking of his own and had to deal with his legacy. It's also a gallery of impressive portraits of leaders and a vivid narrative that builds on Kissinger's self-deprecating sense of humor, as you mentioned, Marty, something that you actually share with him. But let me go back to the very title of your book, master of the game and try to challenge you on it. Kissinger's achievement with Sadat when he pulled Egypt out of the Soviet alliance in the wake of the October 1973 war, which started with the victorious Arab, offen Arab offensive followed by a victorious Israel counteroffensive thanks to US resupplying. Well, one of the unexpected consequences was that it isolated Egypt, which could not play its role as the pan-Arab capital anymore. One way to look at it was that the peace treaty erased the Egyptian military threat to the Jewish state. Okay, but many more threats would follow, both intifadas among others. So, wasn't it Sadat, who actually was in his stead master of the game, who reaped the fruits, first and foremost, by coercing the US into spending billions of dollars of foreign aid on a par with what was spent for Israel, despite Egypt becoming largely irrelevant as a broker for US policy? Couldn't we say that it was Sadat who outsmarted Henry Kissinger on that issue? Thanks, uh, Gilles, and it's a real pleasure to be with you, an honor to be with you. Um, I titled the book Master of the Game, not the master of the game. And yes, uh, Sadat was indeed another master of the game. And as I point out in the book, there are many occasions in which he was at least one step ahead of Kissinger and leading him uh, rather than following him. But they worked very closely together uh, once they kind of uh, aligned their interests. At first, Kissinger regarded Sadat as a fool. He refers to him as um, some kind of character out of uh, the opera, Verdi's opera Aida, which was set in ancient Egypt. Uh, and Sadat started his relationship with Kissinger by evicting the 20,000 Russian military advisors from Egypt which was something that Kissinger had called for publicly two years before and said at the time that when an Arab country does such a thing, then it will be up to the United States to engage and, and take the initiative. But when Sadat did it, Kissinger had such a low disregard for him that he, his response was, well, he gave me something for nothing, so why should I do anything? And he didn't. Even when Sadat sent him some nine months before the 1973 war broke out, he sent him his national security advisor with a far-reaching initiative, which I detailed in the book in, in February of 1973. Kissinger was at first quite excited by it, uh, as was Nixon. Uh, 
But as soon as uh, Rabin, who was the Israeli ambassador in Washington at that time, and Golda Meir, Israel's prime minister, dismissed it as nothing new, Kissinger dropped it. And I argue in the book, although it's counterfactual, that had he picked it up and pressed the Israelis to respond, he might well have avoided the war because Sadat's purpose was to make peace. Uh, it was only when he came to the conclusion that, that, that he would only be taken seriously if he made war that he went to war, but it was to make peace. And it was only after he went to war that Kissinger understood what his game was. And he then took it and molded it for his purpose. Now, your point about isolating Egypt, Kissinger was very concerned about that, as was Sadat at the time. And so from Kissinger's point of view, he was trying to stabilize the order. And he had come to understand because of the war, the war broke out, that he couldn't stabilize the order unless he addressed Arab grievances uh, over the occupation of the territory by Israel some six years before. So for him, the peace process was a way, a mechanism for stabilizing the order. But the real challenge for him was to take Egypt out of the conflict because Egypt, largest, militarily most powerful Arab state, out of the conflict essentially made it impossible for other states, Arab states, to contemplate war, which was a correct calculation, as it turns out. But he understood that Sadat couldn't do it alone. And that's why he also negotiated an agreement with Hafez al-Assad of Syria to legitimize uh, uh, Sadat's engagement, peace engagement with Israel. So he did understand that that was necessary. But it was only, if you recall, after Kissinger left office, when <clears throat> Carter made peace, that Egypt was isolated. Kissinger never sought to drive it to an end of conflict peace. He was always working for another step. And in fact, the step that he would have taken if Ford had been re-elected and he had remained as Secretary of State was short of peace, a non-belligerency agreement. And he would have brought Assad along or tried. All the time that he negotiated the agreement, the second agreement with Sadat, he was going to Damascus, keeping Assad sweet. And as I detail at the end of the book, Assad actually started to talk about peace. So, you know, and, and the non-belligerency agreement that he was working, laying the groundwork for with Sadat and Rabin, he also laid the groundwork for with Assad. So I think that, that um, it's wrong to criticize Kissinger for isolating Egypt. That was not his intention. Throughout uh, the book, and this is something you alluded to already, you refer to Dr. Kissinger's PhD dissertation and first scholarly book, A World Restore, Castle Ray, Metternich and the Problems of Peace, 1811-1822. That era of diplomacy paved the way to 19th century European peace after Napoleon's defeat by retaining a significant role for France. Kissinger was very keen, as you demonstrate, to build such a system of equilibrium for the Middle East. But from reading your book, it looks like he underestimated the shift of the Arab balance of power from the so-called battlefield country, such as Egypt and then Syria, or also some former or, pre or present Soviet clients, the shift to the oil exporting Arabian Peninsula monarchies. He made, and you quote them in, the, in your book, rather disparaging remarks on the Bedouins, quote unquote, who made the US superpower hostage to oil prices when King Faisal engineered the famous or infamous oil embargo on the West. He even expressed some nostalgia for gunboat diplomacy in a way. And, uh, and he displayed a hypersensitivity and you insist uh, very much on that, to the Israeli-Arab file. While US policy, but correct me if I'm wrong on that, from the days of the USS Quincy encounter on Valentine's Day 1945 between FDR and Ibn Saud, US policy had been focused first and foremost on securing the supply of cheap oil to the West so as to compete 
with the Soviet bloc because it took place just after Yalta. In 1956, Ike had ordered Israel together with the UK and France out of the Suez Canal. And in June 67, it was France, it was not the US, which was key to Israel's victory in the Six Day War, thanks to the famous or infamous, there again, Mirage planes. So what do you make of that? In your book, you underline the very ambivalence of Kissinger's relation with Israel as a non-observant Jew of German descent, as you call him. Would you say that this diminished his ability to grasp the primordial importance of the oil issue priority in US policy and that it tilted the balance a little more uh, towards the uh, Israeli-Arab peace and then he sort of was caught unawares by the oil embargo? It's a very uh, interesting question. And, and I think uh, that I have to unpack it a little bit, if you'll allow me. First of all, uh, it's important uh, that you refer to his doctoral dissertation and, and the first book that he published, The World Restored, because that was the template that he had developed uh, in, in his own studies that he then sought to take and apply to the Middle East. I mean, it was a classic Orientalist kind of approach. He had no knowledge of the Middle East. He had deep knowledge of European history. Europe in the 19th century had maintained the peace more or less for 100 years through an equilibrium in the balance of power. So why not apply it in the Middle East? And that's what he tried to do. Castlereagh and Metternich flipped France from being the revolutionary power to being the status quo power after the Napoleonic Wars. Kissinger flipped Egypt from being a revolutionary power to being a status quo power after the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And and so that's what he, he was all about. And it worked. I mean, from his point of view, it worked very well. But... Uh, Oil, as much as it was a vital interest for the United States, was something that he kind of took for granted. Um, In those days, in the 1970s, it's hard to to believe now, but in the early 1970s, oil was handled by the American oil companies, the majors, the Seven Sisters. They had the dealings with Saudi Arabia. and, And there was no expectation in the U.S. government the time that the war broke out, that there would be an oil embargo. There was a concern that it might happen or so on, but they never really uh, were focused on it uh, until it essentially happened. And then what Kissinger focused on was the embargo rather than the jump in the price of oil, which of course was, was imposed by his friend, the Shah of Iran, not King Faisal. The embargo obviously helped to sustain the jump in the oil price, but the jump in the oil price came first. Uh, And so he he had little regard for it originally. Then when the embargo was put on, as you say, he responded to it in a kind of classic great power terms. You refer to his gunboat diplomacy. His attitude was, who the hell are they to hold up us like this? And he was determined that they would not extract anything from the United States by, by holding on to the embargo. And, and he pushed back constantly on them when they tried that. He said, we'll, we'll have a peace process, but we're not going to force Israel back to the 67 lines just because you're holding up the oil, because then there will be no end to it. If we, if we concede on this, we'll have to concede on everything. So we're not going to concede on anything. And, and he got Nixon behind that and instead managed... And, the in dialogue with King Faisal is kind of fascinating uh, because it is this engagement between, you know, this European, uh, German, European historian and the, this Bedouin king. And, and they come to terms, which is basically Faisal accepted Kissinger's step-by-step incremental approach rather than the Eisenhower way of 1956 of imposing uh, the 1967 borders on Israel. And Kissinger managed to convince 
Faisal to go along with that step-by-step -step approach, as he did with Assad, as he did with Sadat. And that was why I call it the art of Middle East diplomacy, because he was the master of convincing them and convincing Israel on the other side, Israel's leaders, that they had to give up territory, which they were uh, determined not to do. Um, but that, that was his skill, his manipulation of, of the arguments to bring all of them around. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hagedorn, and I'm the State Department correspondent at El Monitor. And I'm Joe Snell. I'm El Monitor's video editor. Let's admit it, this past year has been difficult to stay on top of the news and sift through what's accurate and what's misleading. Let El Monitor help you. If you like this podcast and care about the Middle East and North Africa, you should consider listening to El Monitor's other audio series on the Middle East with Andrew Parasoliti and Amber and Zaman, and on Israel with Ben Caspi. You can subscribe to these series on your favorite podcast platforms. And through a host of free daily and weekly newsletters, we offer a range of perspectives with the highest journalistic standards. You can subscribe to these newsletters at almonitor.com. As an award-winning media service headquartered in Washington, D.C., Al Monitor has a network of over 160 contributors around the world. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to visit almonitor.com, where you can find all of these newsletters and podcasts, along with first-class reporting and analysis. We are back with Martin Indyk and his book, Master of the Game. All you have to say about his Jewish identity and the way it was received, well, not necessarily in the Arab world, where after some hesitancy, they sort of thought that as a Jew, he would be uh, able to extract more concessions from Israel. The pages you write about his uh, dealings with the anti-Semitic Nixon administration also are fascinating, you know, remarks about Nixon. He is my first, secretary, first ever Secretary of State who doesn't part his hair and things like that. What you write about uh, this very complex uh, relationship with the Israeli leaders uh, are extraordinary, with uh, Golda Meir as a sort of, uh, of, uh, of a Jewish mother to some extent, to, to all of them, and uh, the very complicated relations with, uh, with Rabin, uh, do you think this was unique, uh, you know, in, in Kissinger? I mean, other, well, other Secretary of States did not have this sort of uh, uh, maybe uh, intellect and also this complex uh, identity, which in a way, even though he was not a versed Orientalist, as we shall see, gave, gave him some uh, sort of, should we say, atavistic access to what was uh, unfolding in the Middle East. So, you know, I, as you said, I followed in Kissinger's footsteps as, as a uh, Jewish uh, envoy, uh, American Jewish envoy, as Dennis Ross, Dan Kurtzer, you know, in, in subsequent years, um, even Jared Cushion, if you like, um, it, it uh, became quite natural uh, for American Jews to be involved in, in Arab-Israeli diplomacy, but it was not natural in those days. In fact, Nixon was an anti-Semite, and and uh, he appointed Kissinger as his Jewish national security advisor. I think because he was Jewish, it was kind of a way of him dealing with the Jews, the elite, the East Coast elite. But he never let Kissinger forget it. And he constantly was digging at him about his Jewishness. And he, from the get-go, told Kissinger he could not be involved in the Middle East because he was Jewish. In other words, he, he essentially leveled the charge of dual loyalty on Kissinger from the beginning. And, and so Kissinger was, I think, deeply offended by this. But in his Kissingerian way, was determined to get around it, not give up the job and resign, but actually work around it. And he, and he did it in two ways. One, by kind of going along with the, the jokes about the Jews and the instances on the tapes where he, he says some pretty unsavory thing about his fellow Jews. Um, even uh, going along with wiretapping of his Jewish aides and Jewish friends in the press. Um, 
and on the other hand, essentially obfuscating what he was doing with Israel because of the concern that he was being charged with dual loyalty. And so uh, he, he, to this day, is very reluctant to admit what he was doing. But it's there in the documents. It's very clear. And in many fundamental ways, he helped Israel. Um, and, and on the other side, with the Arabs, he was very uh, concerned about how they would receive him as a Jew, uh, very worried about it. And there's this wonderful scene in which uh, Nixon is hosting the Arab foreign ministers in the midst of the 1973 Yom Kippur War in the Oval Office. And, and he says to them, uh, you know, my Secretary of State's Jewish, but he's going to be with me on pressuring Israel. And they all kind of laugh at him and say, you know, we're Semites too. It was like for them, it was no big deal. But, but uh, that was the contrast with this anti-Semitic White House and this, some, this band of Semites who were willing to deal with Kissinger uh, and as you said, precisely, I think, because their calculation was he might be more successful in bringing the, the Jewish leaders of Israel around. And, and then there's this amazing scene with King Faisal in which King Faisal was also an anti-Semite in his own way, I mean, against the Jews and believer in the Zionist communist conspiracy. And he's lecturing Kissinger about these terrible Jews and the terrible things they do and so on. And then he blesses Kissinger and and says, I hope you succeed. So um, even there, Kissinger was embraced by, by Faisal uh, out of a belief that he could do something that, that the non-Jewish wasp Americans that they'd been dealing with uh, could not, which was to, to bring Israel along, to deliver Israel, which is what they were looking to Washington to do. So related to what we just said, I, I was also struck while uh, reading your book by the fact that Kissinger, as far as I, I could understand, did not really pay any attention to the importance of Islam in the political sphere. When he goes and visits King Correct. Faisal, for instance, doesn't mention that once. And uh, But, you know, the Yom Kippur War uh, was called the Ramadan War, seen from the other side. Hence, it had to be labeled a jihad. Otherwise, Muslim soldiers wouldn't have been allowed to eat mm. from dawn to dusk because you have to mm. fast during Ramadan. Would you agree with that? I think, I think it's fair to say he was completely ignorant uh, of, of what you described. There's no indication that, that uh, he was aware of, of any of this, any religious dimension to the conflict. And, and that, again, is part ignorance of the, of the Arab and Muslim world. He'd never studied it. He'd never written about it. He'd never traveled there. He traveled a lot before he became uh, a government official. He traveled six times to Israel. Uh, he spent a lot of time in, in Southeast Asia, uh, in Europe, of course. He never traveled to the Middle East, never wrote about the Ottoman Empire when he's writing about 19th century European history. So he was essentially uh, ignorant of it. But on top of that, and I think this is the more important point, Gilles, is that he looked at the world through the, uh, the lens of the great powers. This was a hierarchical world, a Westphalian world of states. He was only interested in the interaction between states and between great powers. And, and his, the what he sought to do in terms of building an order in the Middle East, or whether it was detente with the Soviet Union or the opening to China, was all done in terms of the balance of power between the great powers. And that's why coming back to Jordan, he, he liked the king, but he didn't care about Jordan because it had no weight in, in the system. Uh, Islamic movements, they weren't states. The PLO wasn't a state. So it didn't register with him. He had his own problems <laughs> and they were related entirely to uh, maintaining a stable uh, equilibrium in the balance of power between the great regional powers in the case of the Middle East.
Now, finally, I would like us to, if you like, to play with the Kissingerian toolbox and uh, sort of analyze a couple of uh, very recent uh, events in the Middle East to see what we can make of it. So, either in your capacity as the supreme Kissingerian student or as your capacity at Mar as Marty Indic or both, whatever you want. So, first question. Could you share with us your analysis of the Abraham Accords from a Kissingerian viewpoint? Would you say that they fit his gradual step-by-step -step equilibrium searching approach? And would you say that they managed to reconcile the security of Israel with, if not oil per se, at least or rather with a post-oil approach where sovereign funds from the petro monarchies need to mix with the startup nation high-tech so as to produce and export renewable energy to the world of tomorrow? Or would you dub that approach as too naive, whether it be in a Kissinger fashion or from your own point of view? As long as another big regional player, and if I read your Kissinger well, Iran or Iran, as they say in the, on the West Coast, be it post-revolutionary, hasn't found its place in it. So, could you be our yeah. master of the game for 2021, so, <laughs> please? So, applying Kissingerian principles, he, he, first of all, had a jaundiced view of peace, of the idea that, that nations would negotiate peace agreements, end their conflicts, and everything would be uh, fine in the world. Uh, he thought that peace agreements weren't worth the paper that they were written on, that nations would go back to war when it suited them. And so he sought something more reliable, which, as I've explained, is, was order. But in the Middle East, he came to understand that he had to legitimize the order. He needed a mechanism for doing that. And the peace process, the process of making peace, not the peace itself, was what he introduced as the legitimizing mechanism, by which he meant that would give the Arabs a stake in maintaining the order, because they would see through the process of making peace that they could regain territory, their occupied territory, and that would create a sense of fairness and justice, a modicum of justice in the system. So that was the way he approached it. But his view was that the Arabs weren't ready to reconcile with Israel. Don't forget we're talking about the 1970s now. And Israel wasn't in a position to make the ultimate concessions that the Arabs would demand for such a reconciliation. That is to say, to withdraw to the 67 lines. So his formula was not territory for peace. It was territory for time. You know, he understood the importance of time. And for him, it was time to exhaust the Arabs. Those were his words, to exhaust the Arabs. And time for Israel to strengthen itself with American support, reduce its isolation, to the point where it would be strong enough to make the ultimate territorial concessions. That was his design. And the Abraham Accords, in a way, is a fulfillment of, of his uh, assumption that the Arabs would eventually exhaust themselves. I think it was Mohammed bin Zayed who said, we're tired of this conflict in justifying the, the uh, normalization with Israel. But it took 40 years. I don't think Kissinger really put a time frame on it, but I know from talking with him that he's kind of satisfied that, yes, that, that, that actually um, was what he had in mind. And of course, in the meantime, Israel has grown strong, strongest military power in the region. And it did give up territory for time, but it also used time to tighten its grip on the West Bank. When Kissinger uh, left office, there were 1,900 settlers. Today, there are almost 500,000 in the West Bank. And, and that's not what he had in mind at all. Uh, that's the cruel irony, because his, his 
mechanism required Israel to give up territory, including in the West Bank. And, and he looks at the Palestinians as a state in the making. He believes in a two-state solution in which Israel would have to give up territory and he even says, if it doesn't do so, it will risk consuming its, its moral standing if it relies on naked force, in other words, on military occupation alone. And so uh, he, he's very much in the mode of a kind of uh, wanting the Palestinians to have a state because that's the way he, he views uh, the world. Um, so I think the Abraham Accords are a fulfillment of that Kissingerian vision. But ultimately, the legitimization uh, uh, process requires Israel to settle with the Palestinians as well. One thing I was wondering also that, you know, you, you insist that there has to be no one left out in, you know, in his vision of the Middle East. You have to bring the Palestinians. No one left out who can disrupt the order. What about Iran? Ah, Do you yes, think sorry. that, you know, the... The, the Abraham, from a Kissingerian point of view, I mean, I hope he looks at us and sees those two uh, young guys are totally, you know, they don't understand nothing. Oh, he'd be very pleased that we're talking about him. That's fine. <laughs> so let's say hello to him. Uh, the, wh wh where would he put this Iran thing? Do you think that he would believe that uh, uh, the Abraham uh, system uh, would be complete only if one day Iran, or maybe post uh, Khamenei, Iran would join? Yeah, he views Iran as one of those great powers in the region, great regional power, and uh, also as a great civilization. And he, um, I think this is a, a hangover from his admiration for the Shah's Iran, um, but his, his attitude is that Iran needs to be part of the regional order. Um, but it's a revolutionary state. And by definition, as a, as a revolutionary state, it seeks to disrupt the order. And so he says, when Iran chooses to shift from being a revolutionary state to being a state in the old way, as a state that had an interest in preserving, maintaining order, then it should be brought back into the regional order. Well, Egypt was, uh, was a revolutionary state also. Yes, and, and his role was to make the status quo. So he's not interested at all in regime change, whether it's Iran or Iraq or anywhere else. He doesn't believe in that. He does believe that states will, in the end, act according to their interests. And the challenge is to convince Iran to act as a state that has an interest in the order. And so in the meantime, he's all in favor of the idea that Israel and the Arab states backed by the United States should counter Iran, should, should maintain a balance of power that deters Iran uh, until the point, and again, he has a long view of this, a long view of history. It may take many years, but until Iran eventually resumes the once great role that it has as, as the maintainer of order in the system. One final, I swear it's the final question, uh, but no one will object because I'm sure everyone will listen to, to you uh, for another hour, uh, which is a question which is on everyone's lips and particularly in Europe as the old continent now perceives itself as the next door neighbor to the Middle East and North Africa. The US pull out from Kabul, followed by the US refocusing on the Southern Pacific instead of the Northern Atlantic, or maybe you tell us NATO will soon be replaced by some sort of SPITO, South Pacific Treaty Organization, if it sounds well, as the gatekeeper of world peace and Western interest. I don't know. So does the U.S. pullout from Kabul, and we say U.S. pullout because there was another pullout, <laughs> which was not uh, U.S. before that, uh, does it, in your view, fit in its own stead, a Kissingerian approach to international relations, or have we now seen the end of it? Do you believe that the US still sees MENA, Middle East, North Africa security as a key issue, as it was when you were shuttling in your own stead, and of course when he was? 
And what would be your advice for Europe? Kissinger, I think, would definitely agree with the idea uh, that we need to pay more attention to the rise of China. And he, of course, presided over US foreign policy at a time when the United States was retrenching from Southeast Asia. It had withdrawn from Vietnam, much like Biden has now withdrawn American forces from Afghanistan. And yet, at that time, he engaged in relentless diplomacy, which was what Biden calls for. If there was any example of relentlessness, it was Kissinger's diplomacy in the Middle East. He did not have the, the backing of force uh, to achieve his, his uh, diplomatic goals because of the retrenchment. Uh, he was facing a, you know, a presidency that was imploding because of the impeachment of, of his boss, Richard Nixon. And yet he was able, through diplomacy, to, to uh, construct a, a more or less stable Middle Eastern order that lasted for some 30 years until American leaders screwed it up. Um, so from his point of view, I think, the, the retrenchment in itself it does not uh, result in the United States turning its back on uh, the Middle East that there are still important interests that the United States has, perhaps less than, than before, I think less than before, but nevertheless important. And, and so the United States, as it turns to Asia, cannot ignore uh, the uh, need to stabilize the order in the Middle East. As I said, I think the United States moves from being the dominant power in the region to being a supportive power and, and uh, looking to the regional players to take the lead. It's Israel, um, the Gulf Arab states, Egypt, um, Jordan to a lesser extent, obviously. That's the essence of it. Europe, the United States um, playing a supportive role in that is, uh, I think, exactly what he would have in mind. And Europe with its interests there can, can certainly contribute to, to a stable balance of power. But the big uh, role of Europe as the United States tries to deal with a rising China is in Europe itself and in terms of balancing Russia. That's where the United States needs to, to depend on Europe more. We, I think it's, it's ludicrous to imagine that a one, free, one French frigate in, in the um, Pacific is going to make a, a difference to the balance of power there. But France can make a hell of a difference to the balance of power in, in Europe. And as the United States focuses there, its attention on the Middle East and on Europe is going to be less. And that's where Europe, I think, has a, has a very important role to play. So I, s I see that you're now, you've enlisted in Macron's re-election campaign. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. This was a joke, of course, for who I don't, I'd Like Henry Kissinger, I don't believe in interfering in the uh, affairs of others, unless it's in our sphere of influence. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marty. It was, uh, it was a great pleasure. I'm, su I'm sure we'll have an awful lot of viewers from all over the world. And I'm looking forward uh, to seeing you... Uh, in uh, in real in présentiel as we say um, i hear that the ban for european travelers to europe is going to lift it uh, soon so uh, inshallah see you in new york and you are always welcome here at the council on foreign relations Gilles, to to speak here we we love to have you well thank you all for listening uh, we will be back next month with uh, sultan al qasimi and Todd Reyes, who will discuss their wonderful book entitled Building Sharjah. In the meantime, if you have not done so already, please sign up for Reading on the Middle East and then monitors other podcasts on the Middle East with Andrew Parasiditi and Amberin Zaman and on Israel with Ben Kaspit on your favorite podcast platform.